Right, on that note, um, I'd like to turn over to, to you guys. Um, so we immediately, Heaton's got his hand up, quick as a flash. Um, uh, if there are anybody else, get your hands up soon. Where are our two microphones? One here, Heaton. That's it. Where's our other microphone at the back there? One, two. Okay, we're going to go one at a time for a short bit and then we'll escalate. Thanks. I'm Heaton Shah from the Royal Statistical Society and uh, we think trust is obviously key in this area and I think Carl was referencing some of our research on the data trust deficit which shows that people trust institutions with their data less than they do with uh, in general terms. Um, but I wanted to go down to a specific example because I think actually talking quite abstractly is really difficult and as a result we've partly sort of been moving from private sector to public sector etc etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, data sharing within government clearly provides real opportunities in a period of austerity. Government sits on lots of data but doesn't necessarily always link it together in a way that could be useful for society. Uh, what do panellists think about the opportunities from that and uh, ways in, in which that might be safeguarded as well? And I suppose particularly thinking about uh, CareDot data, the recent example of trying to share healthcare data, which has led to a tremendous backlash, I think, uh, and calls for people to have uh, the ability to opt out but of course, the more you, more people that opt out, the, the the less useful that database becomes in terms of medical research. So, how do we actually get to a place where we can have both the the gains that come from sharing data within government, but also the robust protections that we need as citizens? Because that's clearly what all of us want. Carol, do you want to lead on that? So, um, thank you. Uh, very important questions. Um, in terms of data sharing within government, I think that clearly is uh, to our advantage, but I think that the safeguards rely on the transparency and the purpose for the sharing. So I think that where the public might have concern is where that sharing of data is used to identify or target vulnerable groups of individuals. So I think it's about having a, a, a public debate about the purposes. Uh, but uh, certainly, as you know, initiatives like the Administrative Data Research Network and so on are designed and really aiming to look at that. And I think there's a very, uh, perhaps the Information Commission Office can assist with this, there's, there's a, a perhaps some misinterpretation potentially of the regulatory and legal safeguards. But I, I think given that we can draw on that excellent advice to see what is permissible to make sensible use of data for public benefit, it comes back to my question of who, who, what is public benefit and who decides. And I think particularly where government departments are themselves the data controllers, there's even more need to have, uh, if you like, external gaze and transparency. Um, the CareDoc data, I think, was not actually about sharing across government departments, it was within a government department. And I think there are a lot of lessons learned from that, but the key one, again, relates to my uh, issue about transparency uh, and, and actually treating the public as partners is very, very important. And I think that I actually never received um, my thing through my letterbox. So I'd, uh, you know, I was thinking last night, what did it actually say? Um, but I never got it. Um, but I, you know, I actually think that there needs to be a lot, that, and, and this is, needs to be resourced. So all these things actually need resource. There is a, there's nothing cheap about public engagement if you do it properly, and I think that's probably the challenge, I would say. I, I didn't get my, um, my, my leaflet uh, about care.data data either, and I'm, if you're information commissioner, you're sad enough to wade through all the sort of pizza delivery things looking for this thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, it never turned up, and we, 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 we had advised the LHS that wasn't, that wasn't going to be adequate anyway. The, the, the issue is fair processing, um, uh, but they're, they're going around the, the, the houses again to, 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 to try and to win trust and confidence. What is manifestly a sensible idea? Um, this is where big data can really deliver. We want to know which, uh, which treatments work, uh, which, which hospitals will kill you, uh, which, which GPs will, will kill you. Uh, I think people want it to work, but, but if you do it in a hole-in-corner way, it just breeds suspicion and everybody then gets very worried that their personal information is somehow going to be abused. But look, um, data sharing, this isn't rocket science. We published a data sharing code of practice back in 2010, I think, and it was very difficult to get anyone in Whitehall to pay 
attention to this because this was really before the whole better for less agenda kept, kicked in and they had to take notice. Basically, there are an awful lot of people in the government service, in, in the public service, who know one thing about data protection, and that is you can't do things. Sorry, data protection can't help you. Mm. And, and they feel that's all they need to know. Actually, it's a very permissive piece of legislation if you do things the right way. And our, our guidance is, you've got a problem, think about it, identify the risks, do a privacy impact assessment. The chances are you're going to be able to do stuff. But if all you think you need to know is, sorry, mate, I can't help you, data protection. Uh, you know, whether we tired the public official who says that to me, as they very often do. <laughs> Look, I'd, li I'd like to help you, Mr. Graham, but you know, data protection. I say, do you know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> I think it would have been wise for the uh, whoever's in charge of care.data to hand deliver one of those leaflets to the Information Commissioner's door rather than leaving it to Royal Mail. Yeah, well, um, uh, Chris, as, as the uh, Whitehall, would you ever say that to, to Christopher? Uh, no, and I've, I'll be calling on Christopher when I run into those officials. Uh, <laughs> which will no, no doubt happen soon. I agree with everything uh, that's been said completely, and just to um, give a few examples, I didn't get my care data leaflet either, by the way. Um, when the so so there's a, there's a theme of reciprocity, I think. So so people um, quite happy to give their details to Tesco Cobb Car because they get um, benefits in the shop. With uh, government data use, the the rest, the, you know, the reciprocal aspects of it are a little bit more secondary. Um, so I think that makes the, the, the communication even more important. Um, when the government launched the 100,000 Genomes Project, um, so this is the sequencing of the, the genomes of 100,000 individuals, um, uh, it's vol voluntary. Um, signing up for that, uh, the, the, uh, the, the instructions were, um, okay, your data is going to be available openly, it will be anonymised, however, there is a small chance that it could be uh, matched with another data set and decrypted, and if someone did that, then in theoretically, they could manufacture your DNA and put it at a crime scene, and listed a few sort of uh, dystopian futures for your DNA. I mean, I thought it was brilliant, because it was, look, you know, this bad stuff could happen, but it's really unlikely, and, and I thought that was a great model. Um, the other example I just want to mention uh, is, which links back to the reciprocity point, is something called Health Bank. This is, uh, I've just uh, read about this recently, it's a Swiss um, endeavour and this is where you uh, voluntarily put your health data into uh, this organisation and then they give you discounts on pharmaceuticals, so it's a much more direct connection. Thanks. Right, the next question was here, and then, but I'm going to stop it there because we've got a load of questions, sure. we'll come back. Sure. Um, <coughs> next question here, and then the next question there. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks a lot for your awesome talk so far. One, one of the things I'm most worried about was a few of the earlier speakers mentioned this issue about transparency. And I think Professor Chesel did a really great job of talking about what does that even mean? And, and can we even get the metaphors into people's heads about what's actually happening in the tech? Um, I'm sorry, my name is Joanna Bryson. I'm at the University of Bath. And Bath is a city of only 80,000 people. And so we have uh, one of these government data uh, things where, this, where citizens come in voluntarily and spend weekends trying to make apps that expose the data called Bath Hacked. And they've asked me to be a trustee in this. And I'm slightly afraid to be there, but I don't know someone better qualified. I'm like watching it. Like, I loved the thing that Miller said about the uh, white heat. It's just terrifying. And so I, I don't know, even there, we're pretty sure it's okay for people to know where, you know, what, what the uh, pollution data is and, and where the post boxes are in the toilets. But I, you know, I, I, I would love some more guidance about how to make sure that all the citizens are bought in. And, and even if it works in Bath, is it going to work in London? I lived in Bath for 20 years, and I'd, I'd love to help. Please get in touch. Anyone else want to mention? Yeah, please. I, I think, I think one, one point to, to remember is that it's actually very hard to manage data correctly. It's very hard to keep it up to date, to understand where it came from, and even to link it and correlate between different things. So. It, it, there's, there's a certain skill and a discipline about it, and, even, and many organisations today are really struggling with that basic information management across their, 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 even with their standard data, this is not getting to big data at all, so one of the things we have to remember and maybe invest in, certainly when the government or, or even large companies, is that this is something that has to be taken seriously in the same way that you protect physical assets and, and people. This information is something that, that requires a very systematic and disciplined approach to, to get it right. Thank you. 
And final point, uh, Carl? I think, I think we, we, we struggle in our public conversation to make big data human-sized. So at, at the moment, the, the, there's a real fixation on the technology, natural language processing, Bayesian mathematics, you know, communications metadata. The, the whole vocabulary is, is incredibly technical, quite obscure, and really difficult to penetrate. Like, and it, it was exactly, I, I forgot who mentioned this before, but, but, but talk people, I mean, it's actually not that difficult to talk people through the, the specific, Chris, it was you, the specific kind of like implications of this to them. What could happen to them? What could be found out about, that, about, about them? Um, and what steps they need to take now or in the future if they want to mitigate some of these things? I mean, it, it, it's, big data is not just about technology. It's about, it's about basic insights into society and individuals. And these are things which people are absolutely perfectly capable of being fully, to, f fully informed about and making <coughs> decisions themselves. They care about this topic. You know, this is, not, this is not a question of disengagement or apathy. This is, this is a question of us having to become better communicators of what big data means actually to the people that it's being done to. Thank you. Right, I'll find... Uh, yeah, go on. One I, I think point. I agree with all of that. I think... Fundamentally, though, we're also talking about the intertwining of commercial and non-commercial entities here. So the, the concept of sharing becomes you know, also who's profiting and who makes the decisions. And I think increasingly we have to think about you know, the commercial-driven the commercial uh, aspects of these things. Thanks. Our final uh, one question, and then I'm going to take two questions from here at the same time and two questions from here at the same time. So whoever's be ready with the microphone. Thanks. Can you... Can yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks so much. It's been a fascinating afternoon. Uh, my name's Amy Pollard. I'm from ScienceWise, uh, which is a, a, f a program which supports government to engage in complex, controversial issues in science and technology. Um, we've been working with the Cabinet Office, who are interested in starting to explore a public dialogue around data to enable um, citizens to really get to grips and then get under the skin of these very, very difficult, controversial issues. Um, I'm a little concerned at times in the tone of the debate that that perhaps this is being seen as, as getting buy-in from citizens rather than getting direction from the values and the priorities um, and the and the culture uh, that we want to see in in our future and um, Chris you talked about how society will always evolve around technology and how tech has always been driven by social norms I wonder where the balance is um, between whether technology should be our servant or our master Okay, two quick responses from the panel. I think that's the, yeah. my greatest concern is around this, this idea of like a data determined lifestyle. That if insurers get better at figuring out us travelling to Kabul is more dangerous than travelling to New York, which is again relatively intuitive, but again, if it can be proven, then it becomes tougher. The premium will go up for that person's insurance, and people will stop taking as many risks, and we'll have less of an interesting lifestyle, all in all. And that's a genuine concern, particularly if we see the infallibility of data. And data is fallible. And we have to never forget that also. Yeah. Does anyone else want to mention? Comment? Right, good. No? Right, two questions from here. One there, and then directly behind. Thank you. Thank you. John Tickle, Information Architect at British Gas. So if big data is characterised by its volume, variety and velocity, it's also characterised by the fact it's unstructured. Given those characteristics, does the panel believe that it can be governed at a reasonable price point? And what might that be? Okay, can it be governed? And just behind you. Hi there, I'm Michael Parker from The Conversation. It's a news website with content commissioned by academic experts. I was just interested to hear the um, mention of the identity card scheme from Yes Minister all those years ago and to notice that none of those safeguards were included in the uh, last government's identity card scheme that was kicked out in 2010. Um, isn't one of the problems that there is a great technical, technological illiteracy and uh, uh, misunderstanding of the issues from the, the executive so that regardless of the understanding that, for example, the panel has about the issues, uh, when the time comes to pass laws, those are never enacted. And indeed, the, um, the oversight bodies that we have uh, fail to have sufficient teeth to uh, make sure that there is sufficient governance and the, the risks and rewards are balanced. Who would like to launch on those? Um, okay. Chris and then Mandy. Just on the latest question, I mean, I think 
uh, you know, ministers and, and, and parliamentarians are extremely uh, busy people. They can't be expert in everything. So it's absolutely vital for organisations like the Post and the Office of the Chief Scientist to try and, try and help that debate. And on governing unstructured, it, 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 it's actually irrelevant really whether data is structured or unstructured. When you're, when you're thinking about governance, it's, it's proper understanding of what's in that data and, and its use, and then managing quality, its life cycle, and the protection of it. And so really how structured it is is really not, not a relevant point. It's, uh, it's possible to govern all types of data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would just comment that, um, that quite a lot of the benefit of, uh, from, from data is from uh, the big conclusions that can be drawn from what actually isn't personal information. I mean, if, it's, if you're talking about anonymized uh, information, there are huge insights uh, to be drawn that don't get you into this whole debate about privacy. But I was very interested by uh, John's uh, question there, and it, can it be governed and at an acceptable price point. Very, very good business question, but it does, it does raise the question, what price privacy? Uh, what price freedom? We heard that the Estonians uh, have um, uh, implemented rules for doing this sort of thing properly. And you have to ask, you know, why, why the Estonians? And it's a question I constantly ask myself within the Article 29 Working Party in Europe. You know, why do the Germans care so much? Why do the Dutch care so much? Why do the Estonians care so much? Read history. These are countries that have lived through dictatorships of the right and the left. Of course they care about privacy and they get extremely cross when Brits who've had a, a happier experience uh, are seen to be um, overly pragmatic. If we want to get a proper settlement on this regulation, we have to accept where a lot of these countries have come from, from the bitter experience of the Dutch Jews being rounded up more effectively than the Belgian Jews because the Dutch bureaucracy had a very good ind uh, ID system. And they knew everybody, whether they were Catholic, Protestant, or Jew, and they came to get you. Belgium was a bit hopeless and hadn't got their systems organized, so the Belgian community did better. But these are real lessons of history that we must take into account. And that's why I get so furious when I hear you know, a, a American tech company guys saying, ah, it's all, this is all detailed, and we, you know, we, we, we know the future, this is how it works. It isn't going to convince. And in order to get a satisfactory framework going forward, we have to engage with these real concerns about case. Can I just uh, one quick comment from Carol, and then we'll leave it there. I'll take two more questions. So Sorry. in relation to unstructured data, I mean, I think we need to understand that some of the large data coming forward from uh, government departments <coughs> and routine administrator is structured, but it's not been primarily collected for all the purposes to which yeah. we want to use it in a secondary way. And the Royal Society report talks about usable data. So I just want to indicate that alongside transparency, and by transparency I mean understanding who's making judgments about the use and the public benefit of it, we also need resource to make the data usable and also to understand its quality. There, you know, I think we've got a very good handle on some aspects of quality data in the health uh, data arena, but I think that's perhaps less known in some of the government departments where those data have been less subject to external use. And, and that's a key thing because you know, it's yeah. not just I I I information that can be effective, it's, it's producing reliable information. I think this relates to sort of Mandy's earlier comments very strongly. Okay, that's a good point. Right, we've got two minutes for two questions and some quick responses. So they're going to be super quick. Hands up quick. All right, one here, one and then one behind the two ladies. Yes, that'll do. Thank you. Uh, no, it's all right. But just behind you and then I'll come to you. Just quickly, yeah. Do you think the government should have a back door to um, to everyone's communications if they're encrypted? Um, I'm Olivia Valuinter from the Royal Statistical Society. Good question. Thank you. And then in front of you, just pass the microphone forward, please. Thank you. Hello, we're me. I work for the Department of Business. Um, it's been a really fascinating discussion. I just want to make a quick point. I think someone said quite early on that privacy isn't an absolute right and that kind of set the tone for the discussion. 
I think the question raised by big data is whether there should be a right to privacy, whether the government has a role to draw boundaries to help people access, to prevent abuse of data, because even if it's an enriching for individual companies or individual situations for the government to access data, because even though, like someone said, yeah. We oh. wrap it up quick. Let's go. <laughs> There's been lots of abuses of like data and history, as someone said about the Holocaust. So, you know, like in some ways, that even if there isn't a kind of consistent definition of privacy, should there be a framework? Because even if that's not ideal, maybe it's worthwhile to do so. Thank you very much. I can answer the first question. Go for it. Backdoor into encrypted communications, not if there is no independent oversight. No, no, not backdoor, unmitigated access. That's <laughs> moving on. Carl. I, I, I think, I think uh, g given, given oversight, there absolutely should be a backdoor into encrypted communications. I, 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 I'm horrified by the idea that uh, GCHQ can't get into my phone if it really needs to. But I just want to, as my final point to all, um, uh, just extend Christopher's point one more step. So we do have different historical experiences from the Americans in, in Europe. And I've just come back from Brussels. And there's, there's loads of talk there about why don't we have our own Facebook? Why don't we have our own Google? Why have we failed as the EU? We're not part, we're, we, we are also kind of locked out of the big data revolution here. This is not happening really within the, with the EU. We're not important players in this yet. And like, the, uh, the, there is an enormous opportunity for the EU, given our different historical experience, to give people a whole new relationship with, with big data. Give them value from it. Give, give, give some of the value that big data companies make from them back to them. Communicate to them clearly why, why it helps them in their lives. And we will see a European big data industry flourish. I mean, now, now is a, it's a market opportunity as much as it is, I think, a, a human or consumer right. Yeah. Uh, final word to Christopher. I think there's a huge uh, commercial opportunity uh, with, with companies who realise that um, privacy is what some people what people will pay for. And those companies who differentiate themselves by saying we take you seriously, we respect you, this is, uh, this is what you can do to safeguard your privacy, are, are, will, will be the winners. The trouble is yeah. that the back door uh, that, uh, that Snowden revealed makes my job of persuading people to be sensible to encrypt services and so on to set strong passwords uh, s somewhat redundant. That's why I want to see Parliament establish the equivalent of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which I have in the States. And with all respect to the grand privy councillors in this place who serve on the Security and, and Intelligence Committee, sorry, that isn't quite 21st century. We need proper a proper oversight regime in which we can all have confidence and then we can get on with the business of getting the benefits from big data and the data revolution. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. On that <coughs> note, um, please, um, thank you so much, all the panellists, all of you for, for coming uh, to this. Um, I, I actually read every single sentence in all nine of these post notes about five times in Sign and Law, and I learned a huge amount uh, today. Um, it's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful discussion. Thank you, everyone.